Good morning. Oh, it is a good morning to be together. And as Erin read that, and she was like, this is a lot of verses. Just think, I have to teach all those verses. So, and you have to listen. So, <laughs> uh, doors are locked. Let's go. Uh, John chapter 5. Uh, here's the thing, though. You guys know that Jesus said he was God, right? Like, you guys know that? You know that this wasn't just a legend that was brought up over time. This was actual truth from the beginning that Jesus said that he was God. We see this in the scriptures consistently. Some people will say that this belief of Jesus being God was this legend that was created over time to get people to kind of buy into some morality. And the Bible was written in such a way that would try to get people to have a certain agenda. But what we see today, what we just read, what we're going to study is Jesus makes very clear he is God. And so as we wrestle through this text today, I want you to know that this truth is not something that we're going to hide here. This truth is not something that's masked. This truth is something that every single person who walks on this earth, who has a heartbeat, has to deal with. Jesus Christ was physically born to a virgin named Mary, and he lived a sinless life, and yet he died a sinner's death, and he physically rose from the dead. None of that is legend. None of that was created over time, put together to try to get people to, to walk in some moral agenda. None of that's wishful thinking, and none of that isn't without astounding evidence. But we live in a society that either doesn't care which is probably pretty true. Or maybe they don't care because they watch image bearers of Christ who don't really seem like they care that this message is true. Maybe because people generally don't want authority, so they resist it at all costs that a lot of people really don't want to have anything to do with this Jesus that we talk about. But here's the other thing. Some people just really don't know. They don't know about Jesus' perfect life. They don't know about his death on the cross. They don't know about the physical resurrection. And you don't know what you don't know, and many people don't know because what we've added in instead of this glorious gospel is Christmas trees and Easter bunnies and Hallmark holidays. But when we read scriptures like this one, church, we see that Jesus doesn't leave any room for you to ignore him or to think he's just a good teacher or a biblical character, or a spiritual guru, but that he is the point. He is the Lord God Almighty. So real talk. That, that means truly, truly, I say to you. That's this. <laughs> real talk. There is no more important question than who is Jesus. There's no more important question that you can be asked. So what would you say? And you think about it, and you kind of have the Bible answer, and you think about it, but what would you actually say? And whatever you're about to say about who Jesus is, how do you reflect that belief with your life? Do you answer with your rebellion, or do you answer with your submission to God's very words? We have come out of this altercation that Jesus has with this paralyzed man who had been lame, who had been paralyzed for 38 years, and Jesus heals him, but he does it on a day that was kind of a no-no for the spiritual teachers of the law. He did it on the Sabbath. And it wasn't a no-no because of what God had said. It was a no-no because they had added to God's command. These teachers of the law had added. Isn't that just like the religious to add? And the traditions... They had contributed to the Sabbath law, all of a sudden made it pretty much impossible for people to keep it. And this former paralyzed man had sold out Jesus after being accused of breaking the Sabbath by picking up his mat because Jesus told him to. So that's where we're going to begin today. They, these teachers of the law had connected with this paralyzed man. The paralyzed man sells out Jesus, and now they're going to talk with Jesus. And in my opinion, this is one of the most theological and descriptive passages in all of the Bible. So it's going to get a little heady, but it's also very simple. So verse 16, here we go. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. We studied last week in great detail about how the teachers of the law were attempting to find out who had healed this paralyzed man because they wanted to talk to this person because they knew that person was breaking the law they had made up or contributed to. 
But now we're going to see these Jewish leaders attempt to put Jesus in his place based on their vast understanding of the words of God, which is a little ironic considering who Jesus is. Verse 17, in his defense, or his answer was, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For you and I, this probably isn't that shocking. It's probably not that... Uh, it's probably not that strange to hear Jesus talk about God as his father. This doesn't bend us out of shape. We probably don't get offended by this. But for the Jewish leader in this context, in this culture, this was really blasphemous, strong language. To say that God was your father. Other religions argue about this. They argue that Christians think that they are God's family and how ridiculous it is to think based on how bad we are that we could possibly be in relationship with God and we are bad. Can we just be, admit that? But our relationship with God is not because of us. It's because of Jesus. That's why we get a relationship with God, which Jesus imputes to us. That's a good word. Use that in a sentence this week. He gives to us his perfect record if we trust him at his word. So Jesus, being the son of God, means that because of his perfect life, his death on the cross, his resurrection, we too are made sons and daughters of the God most high through adoption, and we praise him for this. Jesus says that his father is always working and that he, Jesus, too, is working just because it was the Sabbath didn't mean that God didn't work. In fact, if God didn't work, our planet would come out of alignment, and yet it was a celebratory day for God's people to appreciate all that God had done, and they added to it. But the Jewish leaders would also attempt to add to what any and everyone could do on the Sabbath because in their minds, they wanted to try to fit God into a box to say, well, obviously God has to do some stuff, but he doesn't do all the stuff that he used to do or does during the week. And religion will always bind us to rules that we want to justify ourselves by rather than a relationship with Christ, which always ties us to the justifier. So religion will bind us. It will make us try to justify ourselves by stuff that we do. And let's just be honest. Some of us feel good about ourselves today because we came into a church building. And even though we're glad you're here and we're glad you're going to hear the gospel and we're glad you're going to have the opportunity to respond, this does not save you. God doesn't love you more because you show up to a church building. You show up to a church building because God first loved you and you want to know him better and you want to be equipped to be disciple makers as you leave this place. Verse 18, for this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Well, that escalated quickly. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. My favorite misled argument to Jesus being God is the one that goes something like this. Talking with someone who's antagonistic towards the faith, and they will say, well, Jesus never said he was God. Okay, I guess you got us. Let's pack it up. No. He did say that he was God, but maybe he never used the specific words, I am God, with that accent, right? Like he never did that. But you know what he said? He said that he is the great I am, which was the Hebrew understanding of who God was, who Yahweh was, that he is I am. Before the world was created, I am Jesus said the equivalent of I am God. He said, I am. He also said that God was his father, and he and the father were one, and that if you'd seen him, you had seen the father. So this was blasphemous to people that didn't believe him. And at the end of the day, the only reason Jesus was put on a cross by a Roman army, the only reason that the Jews handed him over to the Roman army was because they believed he was blaspheming because he said he was God. So you want to make that argument real, you want to shut it down real quick? Well, Jesus never said he was God. Then why did he get put on a cross? Because he said he was God. And he performed miracles and people watched him do these things and a lot of people believed him. And he equated himself with God. So either he's a blasphemer or he's right. Verse 19, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, 
or real talk. The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. That's important. If you have your Bibles out, even if it's ours, underline that part. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. And this statement right here is not just about how supreme Jesus is or his superiority, but it is about Jesus' activity. What Jesus can and can't do. Often our view of what God does is pretty distorted, if we're honest. We tend to think that he works in all these mysterious ways and puts his son's face on a grilled cheese and that these are the ways that God works, and yet we forget that God actually revealed himself in Scripture, that we can see who he is through the Scriptures, that he made known who he was through the Scriptures. Church, I never want us to be a people that don't point you to what God actually says. Let's not do life hacks. Let's not try to make ourselves better people. Let's trust Jesus at his word. So we ask questions pretty often, at least I know I've had these questions asked of me. We wonder things like, could Jesus sin? I want you to sit with that for a second. Could Jesus sin? I got to ask this. This took me a while. Because he's God, so he's perfect. But he's also man, isn't he? And so if he's man and he's tempted, doesn't he have the opportunity to sin? not saying he did, but couldn't he? And yet we look at this text, and the thing is that Jesus only does what the Father does. And the Father was and is and will always be perfect. He is without stain of sin, no transgressions. He is holy and marvelous and without blemish. Holy, holy, holy is he. And so is the Son. So Jesus ties his actions to the Father and vice versa. Jesus says that he doesn't do things independent of God the Father, and so these Jewish leaders need to know what side they're actually fighting against. This reminds me of a situation in Acts where Peter and John have healed someone in Jesus' name. And this man was paralyzed as well, like the text we read last week. And it creates this uproar in Jerusalem. People are starting to freak out because people start to say, this man was healed. Well, how was he healed? He was healed in the name of Jesus. Well, Jesus is dead. What are you talking about? And it creates this uproar. And so the Sanhedrin, think uh, the ruling council in Star Wars, the Sanhedrin comes and tries to get people together and and tries to get these people to to call out Peter and John. So they, they ask Peter and John to come to this council meeting to silence them. But look at what happens. You don't have to turn there. Just You can make a mark in your notes if you want to, but we're going to Acts chapter 5. Here's what happens. It says, the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, this is so good, we must obey God rather than human beings. Drop the mic. It should be done there. But no, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead. Glory, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Woo! You think he's pointing? You killed him by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and the savior that he might bring Israel to church repentance, and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who sing songs, no. to those who obey him. A whole series could be preached just on that. Oh, our next series is going to be preached all on that. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death, but a Pharisee named G unit, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Gamaliel, thank you. It's not like I speak for a living. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutis appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and his followers were scattered. 
Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. You guys picking up what we're putting down? If it is by human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Wow. I love this story. I love that this is truth. I love that this is history. I love that they could not stop these people because they were on God's side. But I think we're often convinced we're on God's side when it turns out we're actually fighting against him. Let's not say we're on God's side if we can't even quote him. Let's not say we're on God's side if we can't even quote him, but better understanding is to understand what he meant when he said what he said. I hear people quoting verses of people all the time, and I'm like, that's not what that meant. But here's what I can guarantee you. It's a spoiler. You guys ready? Jesus wins. Well, what? I read ahead. He wins. It's pretty sick. And because he wins, I'm with him. But too often we think we're with him when we can't even quote him. We can't even look at what he said and obey what he said. And the churches in the book of Revelation, they had missed it. We don't have time to go in there, but they had become so focused on secondary things. They had become so focused on things that were unnecessary that they had become apathetic to the gospel. They were unwilling to deal with conflict. And Jesus' judgment on those churches are what I hope we as Church of the Valley will never emulate. Verse 20, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. Oh, the Father loves the Son. And he shows him all that he does. And these greater works that will amaze is the work that we all know, that we all talk about. But we don't just talk about it on Easter. We talk about it every day because the resurrection from the dead changed everything. Can I get an amen? It is the resurrection from the dead that cements Jesus' claims. It is the resurrection from the dead that is the evidence that your sins have been forgiven. You know why? Because if all he did was die on a cross, he's a liar. But he rose. It is the resurrection of the dead that is what people lack belief, understanding of, and submission to two. And if Jesus rose from the dead church, there is no argument against him. So when you're having a discussion with someone and they think your faith is placebo, weak, and ridiculous, bring up the resurrection and see where that conversation goes. Most people run from it. You know why? Because there's no answer against it. If Jesus rose from the dead, there is no argument against him. But if he didn't rise from the dead, he's a liar, he's a deceiver, and he has misled millions upon millions. So not only can you not say that he's not, he's, he's not just a good teacher or he's not just a really good man, he's either God with skin, Savior, Lord, or he's the devil incarnate because he's pointing people to a false hope. So it's one or the other, church. That's why this question is so important. Who is Jesus to you? Verse 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Jesus, the Savior, the Lord, the one we sing praises to, was pleased to give life. And he did this by giving up his own life as a sacrifice and payment for yours and my sin. But it's not enough to just see this exchange as us not being dead, but we were made alive being made alive, being made righteous, having a life that is now lived for God rather than just because of God. And too many of us live just because of God, but we don't live for him. And we're missing out on the purpose in which God has given us. One thing I notice when someone first becomes a believer is that they swear a lot. No, Um, what what I notice when someone first becomes a believer is that they get really excited about something. But it's not always about Jesus. They may be really excited about being part of a community that's bigger than themselves or about not feeling as guilty about their sin. But when we're made alive, church, 
We're not just a better, more cleaned up version of who we once were. We are not spiritually dead anymore. We are spiritually alive, and that makes us a new person. And when you are born, you grow. Like, y'all know this, right? Like, none of you were born at the size you're currently at, I hope. And when you're born, you grow because living things grow. Don't miss that. I get asked all the time if I think that you have to do anything to be saved. Well, do you have to do something to be saved? And just like our physical birth, we had no say in it. So if you're around a parent right now that's your own parent, say, I had no say in the matter. You say that to them right now. Thank you. (laughs) The wills are on it. But like our physical life, we grow, we learn, we change over time. And if we want nothing to do with God's commands, we want nothing to do with the statutes or word, I'd say you believed in something, but it was not Jesus Christ. And so I give you that warning because I want us to understand that we do nothing to be saved, but because we are saved, we work unto the Lord. Verse 22, moreover, the Father judges no one. Oh, that sounds good. Cool. But (laughs) has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Oh. And we see in the past verses that Jesus equated himself He made himself equal with God, which was probably getting these Jewish leaders pretty heated, pretty angry. They wanted to kill him. And I'm wondering what could be said that would make me want to kill you. I think unredeemed people think that if they talk trash about God or about Christians, that we'll get super defensive and try to convince them otherwise and talk them into the kingdom. Oh, I'm going to arm wrestle you into Jesus. It doesn't work that way. But most of the time when I connect with someone who doesn't understand the glory and the beauty and the power and the majesty of knowing Jesus Christ, the Lord, I grieve for them. I grieve for them, not because of where their eternity will be spent or because I think I'm better because my eternity will be spent somewhere else, but they're missing out on knowing God. There is no greater purpose than knowing your creator and knowing what he's done for you. And knowing that he made a way so you didn't have to work your way to him, but he worked his way to you. So we've seen that Jesus is equal in his godness. That's a word I just made up, red squiggly line. But we also see here that he is equal in his authority and equal in honor to the Father. I think many of us can get behind this idea that Jesus is God. If we have a church context, we can get behind, yeah, he's God. We're not new to this concept, but we are kind of new to the fact that Jesus comes to judge, that he has the authority to judge. And Jesus is the perfect judge, not because of just his perfect actions, but because Jesus is fully God. Verse 23, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. We have a lot of people in this world who worship a God of their own desires, one they've made up in their own minds because they're pretty illiterate to the word of God. But if you do not honor the Son, you do not honor the Father. So don't say you love God and yet treat Jesus like good advice. Don't say you love God and say that Jesus was a good idea. That's not honor. That's apathy. That's not honor. That's lip service. Verse 24, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. Whoever hears and believes. It's really easy to hear the words of God and ignore them, isn't it? Or is that just me? Oh, thank God. It's actually too easy. It's actually too easy because in our society and everywhere we go, we want to trust creation rather than the creator. But it's not those who just believe in. It's those who actually believe God in his word. It's those who believe God in his words put into practice who, when we allow the word of God to sanctify us and transform us, that's when we know we've gone from death to life. 
It is not those who simply acknowledge that God may have existed, but those who realize that not only does he exist, but we exist because of God's beautiful grace. Verse 25, very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come. I love when Jesus says that. It's coming here, now. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who will hear will live. Huh. This verse and the next few verses is focusing on resurrection, but not just the resurrection of Jesus. I'll explain in a second. And there is already this, this um, well, what there is is like an already, not yet, tension. Okay, let me, let me explain what I mean. We understand, I hope, that Jesus physically rose from the dead. I hope we get that. But do we understand that people who have died will also physically rise from the dead? Do we get that? And we will be resurrected unto eternal life or unto eternal separation. Oh, the pastor's talking about H-E double hockey sticks. Well, it's in the text. Meaning those who have committed to Christ, they will be resurrected into eternal life. They will be resurrected to glory. They will be resurrected into the kingdom of God or how Matthew says it, the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says those who are dead but hear his voice will live. What can you do when you're dead? The right answer is nothing. And here is what he means. Those who are spiritually dead, those who are without the Spirit of God inside of them, those who are dead, they cannot hear, but God has given his Spirit to some. God has given his Spirit to those who have received Christ, those who have been redeemed by God. They can and do hear Jesus' voice. So when we talk about miracles, let's talk about the miracle that any of us would ever be saved. Because I don't deserve it. And I was walking in transgression, walking the way I wanted to walk, and God in his infinite grace decided to make me alive. That is a hallelujah moment when you realize it. See, it's those who hear and obey that are being regenerate because God has put his spirit in them. And Jesus didn't come to clean us up. He came to make dead people alive. And that's why we worship him, because he's done what we could not do. We can clean ourselves up all day. We can will it to stop trying to do bad things-ish. But God, he's given us his spirit. God has made dead people alive. But again, there is this already not yet tension in this explanation because we know that many had simply believed in what God had said through the prophets. So if you're reading your Old Testament and you're going through it, We don't actually see Jesus' name, even though I believe Jesus is all throughout the entire book. But then there's this time at the end of the Old Testament, before we start to hear from the gospel writers in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and at the end of the Old Testament, it goes quiet for about 400 years, and there's nothing that's written and put into Scripture. And so here's the question that comes up pretty often, and, and, and I want us to understand this, and we can debate this if we want, but whatever, I have the microphone currently. There was 400 years of quiet before Jesus came, was born to Mary, lived the life we couldn't live, died the death we deserved to die, and physically rose from the dead, extended to, ex- went to heaven, and one day he's coming back to judge the earth. But what about those people that believed in Christ? Or what about those people that didn't believe in Christ prior to Jesus doing all of those things? What about them? What about those people who haven't necessarily heard the gospel the way that you and I have? Well, they believed God. And in the book of Romans, if you're ever like, man, what book should I read? Read the book of Romans, all right? But find someone smarter than you to help you with it. So book of Romans, here's what it says. Chapter 4, verse 18, Paul, the apostle, is talking. He says, against all hope, Abraham, and if you have church experience, you're familiar with Abraham, Isaac, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. 
being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. That means right standing before God. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us. He's talking to us. To whom God will credit righteousness for. Us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification, our righteousness, our right standing. Abraham believed God at his word and trusted his promises, and it was accredited to him righteousness. Not because of his morality. Abraham's morality was terrible but because of his faith in what God had said thus far. And it was a foreshadowing of what was to come. It was not just faith in what God had said and what he would do, but you and I, we get to have faith in what God has already done through the perfect life lived of Jesus, the death on the cross, and the resurrection from the dead. So we don't need progressive revelation because Jesus has already done it. He's already lived the life we can't and died the death we should, and risen from the dead. And so we, because of what Christ has proven, because of his love for us, because we are repentive, because of all of these things, we now trust God at his word. Verse 26, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Jesus uses this designation of the Son of Man. It was a a designation from the book of Daniel. It was talking about the future Messiah that was coming, and this was the one that Jesus used hundreds of times in the New Testament. And Jesus has always been. You guys get that, right? Like, Jesus has always existed. Like, Mary's great, but Mary shouldn't be worshipped, okay? Yeah, you can quote me on that. We'll make a little meme, all right? Mary's great, but she shouldn't be worshipped. Jesus has always existed. He's always been. He's always been deity. He's always been God. But there was his incarnation. There was Jesus being born of Mary, the Virgin, and the Holy Spirit. And he became the incarnation. God coming to earth in human form. And by coming to earth as a man, Jesus voluntarily set aside the independent exercises of his divine attributes. That's what Jesus did. He came and he voluntarily set aside some of the things that he could have done as God. But I love what John Calvin says. He says this quote, what had been hidden in God is revealed to us in Christ as man and life, which was formerly inaccessible is now placed before our eyes. So you want to know what God's character is like? Look at Jesus. You want to know what God does? Look at Jesus. You want to know how much God loves you? Look at Jesus. And God has given his son, Jesus, the authority to judge the earth. That means that in comparison to him, I hate to spoil this for you, in comparison to Jesus, you lose. Every time. Every time. But because of God's inexpressible grace, you do not lose in comparison to Jesus. Because if you believe him at his word, he imputes his righteousness. He gives his righteousness to you. So we don't compare ourselves to him. We want to look more like him. But he already did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Verse 28. Jesus continues, do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice. What? And come out. Huh? And those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. All will be resurrected, church. But it is those whose disposition of submission to Jesus as the king who will rise to eternal life rather than eternal separation. This is not those who are good people go to heaven and those who are bad people go to hell, okay? You really got to understand this because if what you're taking from this text, what you're taking from as I share this with you is, well, I just have to be gooder, which is terrible English. 
If all I have to do is do good things and then I get to go to heaven, that may be a really old song that Eddie Vedder covered, but that is not true. Good people do not go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Bad people don't go to hell. Unforgiven people do. And this is determined upon God giving you the ears to hear and, see, and the eyes to see the story that the author of life is writing. It is your belief, acknowledgement, and faith response that justifies you because of what Jesus has already done, not because of your begrudging submission or attempting to be good enough that will ever save you. So, verse 30. By myself, Jesus says, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Jesus, once again, unashamedly equates himself with God the Father in judgment. And yet his judgment is not apart from God's perfect will. Jesus didn't hide the fact that he was from the Father. And he didn't hide the fact that it was only through him that any of us could be saved. Our relationship with God is not about us measuring up to Jesus, but by us bowing down to him. Our relationship with God is not about us measuring up to Jesus, but us bowing down to him. So Jesus will judge you one day, not by how good you were, but by how good he is. And did you, by faith, trust that he is enough? Last question. Worship team, you can come on up. Here's my question as they distract us. <laughs> Do you believe the author of life? Or are you attempting to write your own story devoid of Jesus Christ? Do you believe the author of life, or are you attempting to write your own story devoid of Jesus Christ?